Welcome back to the Mental Health Toolbox. In this episode, we're talking all about how to earn more while working less and have more autonomy with author and speaker, Joe Sanok. This is gonna be a good one, so stick around. It's like we're running in circles. Joe Sanok is the author of Thursday is the New Friday, hitting the shelves October 5th, 2021, He's also a TEDx speaker, consultant, and top podcaster. With over 600 interviews, he has expertise in brain optimization, slowing down to spark innovation, and the four-day work week. He's also known as the owner of practiceofthepractice.com. Hey, Joe. Thank you so much for making it onto the Mental Health Toolbox podcast. I appreciate you taking out time today to be on the show. Patrick, thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. I have been um, a follower of yours for some years now. I remember stumbling onto your stuff uh, when I was looking into starting a private practice and you were just, the, oh, not just a wealth of information, but almost um, like the only one, you know, out there that was offering that kind of material for, for therapists who are daring to jump you know, from the dock to the boat of private practice. And I just want to start by saying thank you so much for, uh, you know, putting all of this fantastic information out there, this resource for clinicians um, looking to uh, branch out. So thank you. first and foremost. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. It's been such fun work to do and to really just follow my own curiosity and kind of bring people along for the ride. It's been a fun way to do a podcast and to create content. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, first someone on your website, and then of course your YouTube videos. Great video, by the way, on how to start a private practice. That's fantastic. Um, and then your podcast became an avid listener. So, but that's not all you do. You're kind of a jack of many trades, and um, I, you know, I, I think of you as an ambassador for therapists, mm -hmm. right? An, an ambassador who helps therapists, you know reach their goals of expansion, whether that's group practice, private practice, you have all of these resources, you know, between your seminars, retreats, killing at camp, um, your podcast. I'm wondering what, what, what are you best known for? Or what would you like to be known for? Mm. I mean, I think those are two different things. I think I'm best known for the podcast, because when I launched that in late 2012, uh, it was intentional to find a, a market where there wasn't anybody at the time. And so when you say there was no one else, really, there weren't any podcasts in 2012 around the business of, of private practice. And so I think because of that, you know, whenever there was a, a new podcast that came out or a new consultant, they frequently would have me on it and say, oh, I've listened to you for years. And uh, it's so awesome to now know all these amazing podcasters that I've known since they first started now other big time consultants also. So I think I tend to be known for the podcast and then uh, a lot of the services we offer from that. Um, what I would want to be known for, um, really, at least in regards to kind of the book and what I've learned from the book is reshaping society towards the four day work week. Um, as I dig into the research and the history around how we look at time and, and honestly, just, you know, what it's like to be the post pandemic generation we have an opportunity right now to reshape all of society in a way that's healthier, that's more creative, it boosts productivity. Um, and, and I think that the starting point for that is moving away from the industrialist model of the 40 hour work week and seeing people as machines and, and to just move into more of an evolutionary model uh, that has the four day work week as that starting point. Yeah, very timely with the pandemic. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's so funny. I joked like this book sponsored by COVID-19. <laughs> like, like when that was happening and I'm writing this book, I mean, I was able to put so much of what was happening because I wrote it from April of 2020 to September of 2020. And, and so it was in the thick of it all. I was just say, hey, we're going through this and here's how we're thinking about time. And so to have a book that was literally written during the pandemic and it's challenging our view of time. At first, I thought it was going to be really tough for my book launch, but across the board, people are saying, I want to rethink how I do time and work. So uh, it really is more timely than I could have expected. Oh, I'm sure you and I'm sure you jump into all the concepts around time management in the book, you know, I'm excited to get my hands on it. You know, I hear about ideas of the hustle culture and Gary V and, but you know, batching time, but not everybody works the same, right? So I'm excited to see your thoughts on it. Yeah. And I think that so often these kind of books either fall into their, a productivity book that just says here, do this work. 
uh, and they give you a very prescriptive model, uh, which some people need. Uh, but I would say this book is more of a menu model where it says, here's how you can grow and be smarter and do experiments and see what works for you. Um, and some things will work for some people, some won't. Um, and, and so having that non-prescriptive model that, that guides someone to think for themselves, or on the other side, we have all these you know, meditation books and other kind of woo-woo books, make a vision board and don't even like put any effort into it, just manifest mm -hmm. it to the universe. But what I really like about what the research that's emerging is showing is that we need to merge those two types of books that it's genuinely the slowing down. It's the stepping back. It's how we do our weekends. It's how we do our evenings, how we do our vacations that helps us be more productive, that helps us do the best, most creative work. Um, and that too often we fall into these two very different camps and neither one is right on its own. But when it comes together as a collective, we have this amazing system where slowing down actually leads to killing it. You know, that makes sense too. When you think about the alpha mindset, you know, when you're in the shower or like taking a walk somewhere, that's when I have my best ideas when I'm relaxed, right? Not so yeah, stressed all the sure. time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's where you know, when you're most stressed out, that, that's not when you have your best ideas. You just default to what you know. Uh, I often tell a story about how when I was in Nepal, um, I got chased by a wild rhinoceros and our, no our, our guide had told us to climb a tree and I just didn't. I just took off running and because um, I knew that I could outrun the people I was with for at least, you know, several hundred yards. <laughs> Slowest person is the And it's like, you know, I got three human shields behind me. Yeah. And it's like, why didn't I climb a tree when the guide had said, if a rhinoceros chases us, climb a tree? Well, when we're stressed out, we go with what we know. You're not going to try something new, like climbing a random new tree in Nepal. Like, what if I slipped and then got killed by a rhino because I tried something new? So we don't try new things when we're stressed out. And so much of whether we're in a typical kind of job where you're at a 40, 50 hour work week, or even as an entrepreneur where you're doing great work as a clinician, but you always have ideas and you're always going after the next thing. And like, when can you turn your brain off and say, you know what, enough is enough for the week. I need to chill out and go have fun for the weekend so that my brain recovers. And then next week I'm going to have an even more creative week because I actually took that time to go for a walk or, or slow down. Yeah. So productivity, really, a lot of it boils down to being open to ideas, giving yourself room to play like a sandbox right yeah kind of like absolutely. that absolutely yeah. that whole idea and, and I think, of um creating space yeah i think even going further before you slow down i talk about um internal inclinations and that mm -hmm. there's these three inclinations that top performers have uh, that the research really kind of shows over and over and so if we start inside and, and do that work first before we ever get to slowing down our productivity we're then more effective in those areas that we aren't slowing down and then saying, oh, I should achieve more. Like, why am I not mowing the lawn and doing all these things around the house to complete all these tasks? We've done the inner work that then allows us to slow down. And then that slowing down then allows us to kill it more. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, you know, I think is particularly interesting is that you're not just a therapist, you're a very seasoned therapist, right? with a lot of real life application, I know you've been through it and we could, I'm sure, dive into all of your hardships that you've been through, um, which I know you've touched on in the past. Um, but your perspective, you know, as a therapist and then how you package that experience into, into a book like this on productivity, I think is a fantastic intersection because so many therapists, I think when they think about the idea of doing private practice and my own experience, um, making that jump or any big change other than the terrifying unknown factor and all the, <laughs> the risk and catastrophizing, right? That goes on in your head about the worst possible scenarios is time, right? How could I, I'm already working X number of hours a week, plus juggling kids and a family and other responsibilities and laundry and mowing the lawn, like you said, all of those, the, the minute tasks that we, that make us feel productive. How am I possibly going to find time to write that book or how am I possibly going to carve out time to start that business without parent guilt, right? Or feeling like an imposter, you know? And so I, I'm wondering like, how did you, what drove you to touch on this subject in particular, this intersection? Yeah. You know, part of the evaluation process and doing a traditionally published book, I worked with a writing coach for a solid year 
And she and I, every Thursday would meet and she just got me talking. And, and really part of her work with me was to say, what are the things that Joe teaches over and over and over that isn't just regurgitating what other people have taught? What, what's kind of the unique point of view that I have? And for months, I was just like, what are we doing here? Every week we talk, like, what are we doing? And she'd drill in here and there. And then finally it was, here's what I'm hearing. Tell me if this is accurate. You know, you really help people work a four day work week or fewer. You help people do these, these things. You see people live these like just huge lives, but they're not working like crazy. And so to hear someone like yourself say, oh my gosh, I've got all this, this stress. And then how could I even add one more thing on like when I'm working in these consulting relationships to see people go from feeling that way to being able to really define what the best use of their time is, have amazing systems that do things that they used to be doing, but now they have systems or people in place that are doing that. And then to say, wow, I just freed up a full extra day. Do I want to spend that with my kids? Do I want to spend that doing stuff around the house? Cause that helps me feel better entering into the weekend. Do I want to spend half that day working on a book idea or an e-course or a podcast? And, and to kind of, the way that I conceptualize things is I have the work that I'm doing that is the plates that are spinning. How do I get those spinning enough that I have to put very little effort into those so that the team keeps it going? And then how do I then move into whatever that next big thing is? So right now that's a season of this book of, you know, it was first finding an agent, then it was writing the book and, you know, getting a book deal and, and then promoting the book. And, and then, you know, as this continues, I don't know what doors will open. Uh, the next reasonable step will, will reveal itself. So then the book may move into that plate spinning category where there's automations I need to have set up within the business of, you know, reaching out for podcast interviews or things like that. And then I have the next kind of new thing. Um, and so kind of having that cycle where, every new thing doesn't become more on my plate. It becomes more on the team's plate and we may have to hire people to keep that going, but it's not ever that my plate is overflowing and I'm stressed out as a result of the work that I'm doing. Well, that's fantastic. That's the goal, right? Is to be able to create, get time back, right? With systems and, and then that kind of resolves the parent guilt or family guilt or whatever, the, whatever other obligations we mentally tied ourselves to, right? Conflicts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even when I enter a weekend, uh, I do the same thing that I do during the work week. So during the work week, I'm always thinking, what's the highest and best use of my time? And so uh, me showing up on this podcast, I can't send my director of details to come hang out with you and talk about the book. I mean, I could, but it wouldn't be the same interview, right? Sure. Um, same sort of thing. If I enter into a weekend and, you know, right the moment we're recording this, it's summer in Northern Michigan where I'm at. Uh, to say, by the end of summer, what do I want to look back on and say, I'm so glad that I did that now that it's you know cold again and it's fall and winter's coming. Mm -hmm. What are the things that I'm going to wish that I had done more of? And so to say, I'm going to make sure that this weekend we go to the beach. I'm going to make sure this weekend we go on a bike ride or go get ice cream. Uh, uh, this weekend, I want to play a board game with my daughters. And so to really define out the big things first, and then to be able to then say, okay, now I need to fit in those other things that are more menial tasks. So grocery shopping mm -hmm. or mowing the lawn or those things. And then maybe it's, okay, wow, I need to outsource the lawn mowing to the neighbor kid. And I just bought back part of my weekend. And, or maybe I need to use Instacart and it may cost me $20, but it just saved me three hours of amazing weather in Northern Michigan that we wait for all year long, you know, and for 30 bucks, I now have enough time to now go to the beach. Um, and so really analyzing your use of time and money in your own, within what you have the ability to do. And I, I know that not everyone can just throw money at things, but we can be strategic around, these are tasks I really don't want to do. And I'm going to then figure out how I can automate it as best as possible in my personal life and in my business. That's fantastic. Very well said. You know, it reminds me of that concept we hear that, you know, stick to your zone of genius, do it only you can do it with all these CEOs and popular entrepreneurs will tell you, but as a therapist, what's ringing in my head when you talk about this is the idea that meaningful behavior, right? When we think about them, what's the most meaningful when you talk about regret, you know, anticipated regret or would be regret using that as a way to kind of work backwards to reverse engineer what's important, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that therapists often think that they have to bootstrap a lot of their business a lot longer than they really need to. And so you know, the typical therapist might be doing all their own SEO work. They're doing all their own website updates. They're doing all their own blogging. They're doing all the phone calls, just the list of things that aren't therapy. 
you know, when it comes down to it, a therapy session, you're making a lot of money compared to the average person in one therapy session, even if you're on insurance. And so to say, I'm going to pay someone 15, 20, $30 an hour to do these things so I can do an extra hour of therapy. I mean, the ROI on that is just huge. And oh, so, yeah. you know, it's even when, if you're a part-time therapist to have someone part-time that's helping with that backend stuff, uh, it then makes you most effective to say, I'm just going to do the therapy and the little bit that it takes to support that. And then I also want to continue to expand beyond the therapy practice with, you know, being a podcast guest or whatever the things are, um, you then can level up so much faster than if you just bootstrap every single step of the process. Yes, absolutely. That makes complete sense. I'm wondering, um, given your history, I mean, being entrepreneur, TEDx speaker, and this isn't your first rodeo with being an author. This is like your fifth book, right? Um, what would what would you say made this book so important? I and mean, with all the things you could talk about, like why this one? Yeah. So I think the other books <clears throat> were hyper focused on the private practice world, uh, which was important and is important. Um, but to me, this is the first one that really says what skills have I learned as a therapist that apply to therapists, my own audience, but then also apply to general society. Uh, and to say, what do small business owners need to know worldwide um, that I have the market on or that I've learned from you know, working with thousands of private practices? So, so now to be able to say, not only is this going to help the therapists that are already listeners, followers, whatever word you use, but it also then helps general society move in a healthier direction um, towards the four-day work week. That's where it gets really exciting to me to say, I get to be a part of a conversation that's already happening. It doesn't need to be that Joe Sanok is the only leader of the four day work week, but that I get to be a strong proponent of it. And to say, I'm joining this conversation, I'm getting people's ideas, we're posting it to the website, we're, we're doing experiments to just see what works. Um, and that we really, as this post pandemic generation can reshape society in a way that aligns with what the neuroscience is saying, aligns with what kind of creativity research is saying and productivity research, and to say we can better society by working less and being less stressed out. Great, fantastic. Um, I'm wondering, where can our audience find out more about you? Where can they find your book? Where do they go? Yeah, so they can find the book wherever they get their books, you know, their local bookstore, I'm sure would appreciate you ordering through them. Uh, it's available October 5th. So you can get it on Amazon or any online dealer as well. Um, we're going to be posting experiments, book clubs, all sorts of additional resources, um, some video trainings on joesanok.com. So joesanok.com is going to be the hub of all of my speaking and writing. Uh, so that's the best spot there. And then if people want private practice resources, practiceofthepractice.com is the best place to get all of those. All right, going strong. <laughs> oh, it was definitely a beacon for me, you know, years ago. Practice of the practice.com. Awesome. Um, all right. Anything uh, else you would like to add? Anything that any golden nuggets you would like to impart to our audience? I think my final words would just be that you have the ability to level up and to do things for society that you don't even consider or recognize right now. I um, mean, it's not going to be you hustling and being burned out and stressed out that's going to get there, you there. It's going to be slowing down and allowing your brain to rest to really see those creative pain points that you want to help address in society. So give yourself permission to slow down and it's going to help you be more creative and productive. Fantastic. And this new book, Thursday is the New Friday, is a great way to give you insight into how to do that, right? Absolutely. Pause. And permission. Oftentimes I feel like we just need to give ourselves permission to slow down without, you know, feeling guilty about it. And so I think from what I understand already, just in talking to you and, and seeing other interviews about the book, I'm excited. And I think this is going to be helpful to so many people and figuring this piece out of personal development, really, and what this is all about. Okay. Well, thank you so much for helping uh, make Thursday the new Friday. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> I'm already living it. Okay, Joe, um, I appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy, so I'll go ahead and let you go. Um, and I will end the recording.